We left off last time talking about uh, particle wave duality, just kind of uh, getting into the first explanations of how things like electrons can have both particle and wave-like nature. Um, and this is a topic that is relatively new in science. It's only been around for the last hundred years or so. Um, and so when it was first, oops, too far, uh, when it was first uh, discovered, when it was first uh, proposed that you could have things that sometimes behave like a wave and sometimes behave like a particle, um, scientists were naturally and justifiably skeptical, uh, skeptical that um, a particle could behave like a wave in some situations. And so they designed an experiment, and there were actually multiple experiments that were done. I'm just going to describe one of them here just for the sake of time. Um, they designed an experiment to try and explain why when you shoot electrons at a double slit, the double slit uh, experiment gives you a diffraction pattern like a wave for those electrons. Their idea was maybe um, when a uh, when the electrons are being shot at this uh, double slit, they're kind of bumping into each other or they're repelling each other, and so then you get this what looks like a diffraction pattern, but it's not actually a diffraction pattern. And so they shot electrons one at a time at the double slits. So they would do one at a time one after the other after the other at these double slits and what they saw was that the electrons still behaved like a wave. What that means is that when the electron was moving towards the double slits here it didn't just go through one side or go through the other side um, it went through both slits simultaneously and interfered with itself to produce the interference pattern on the detector. Now it's actually a little bit stranger than that actually that not only does it go through both and interfere with itself but it uh, goes through just one, just the other, it actually does all of the above. Um, it does all of the possible things that it could do uh, and what you see on the detector on the back side is uh, as a result of that. Is a essentially a, a summation of every every possible thing that could happen to the electron. Um, and so scientists kind of taking that a step further thought, well if the electrons are splitting and going through both slits at once, let's see if we can watch them do that. And so they thought they were being sneaky and they put a detector, uh, it's actually a laser, um, that uh, will give a signal when an electron passes through it, they put it right past those double slits. So if the electron is going through the two slits simultaneously, if it's uh, acting like a wave and going through both and interfering with itself, they should be able to see that, they thought. But what happened was as soon as they put the detector behind that double slit, the electrons went back to behaving like particles, as if they had been particles the entire time. So if the detector was not here and they were just impacting uh, the screen on the opposite side, they behaved like a wave. If you tried to detect them behaving like a wave, they say, nope, you know, they go back to acting like a particle. And the really crazy thing is they weren't detected until after they'd gone through the double slits. So the only two options are either they knew beforehand they were going to be detected and therefore always behaved like a particle, or they behaved like a wave, went through both, but then retroactively said, nah, never mind, didn't go through both, just went through the one side. Either one of those options is crazy nutso balls for stuff on the macro level. Things cannot know what's going to happen to them in the future, and things cannot say retroactively, nope, I actually didn't do that, I only did this. Like, you can't do that with macro-sized things, but with quantum mechanics, things are a little bit different. Things can act pretty strangely. Um, so if you're interested in this, um, that's all I'm going to go into now on this just for the sake of time, but if you're interested in looking into that stuff more, I would encourage you to look into, uh, like maybe look at YouTube for uh, videos on the double slit experiment and or the uh, quantum eraser. 
experiments. Um, they're, they're pretty interesting topics and very, very strange. So essentially what this was telling us is that no matter what experiment is designed and no matter how precisely you make your measurements, we're never going to be able to detect electrons diffracting through two slits at once. The very act of observing the electrons changes how the electrons behave. They're behaving in one manner, you try to see them doing that, and they change the way they behave because you tried to detect them. This leads us to what we uh, are going to call, and what everyone calls, uh, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which tells us that we can never determine the exact path or location of an electron. We can only discuss the probability of an electron being somewhere. Essentially what the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle says is that when you have something like an electron, it's so tiny, and it, because it's governed by quantum mechanics much more than it is by uh, classical or Newtonian mechanics, the simple act of looking at the thing changes it. The simple act of figuring out where it is then changes how the thing moves or the simple act of detecting which direction is this thing moving in then moves it. Like you, you can never know exactly where it is and where it's going. You can only ever say there's a 95 percent chance that it's in this volume right here. So we can speak about it in terms of probabilities but we can never say the electron is there, you know, right in that one spot. So the mathematical uh, formula for the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle is shown here. I'm not too worried about you using this. We're not actually going to use it in any practice problems or anything. Uh, but uh, just understanding essentially what it's telling us is that you can never know the velocity and the position at the same time. If you know one, you can't know the other. Um, because by figuring out one of the two, you would have changed the other one. So this is actually true for everything in the entire universe. Um, there is actually uncertainty as to your position right now. But because you are so much bigger than an electron, that, uh, it, that uh, difference between uh, where you, well, I shouldn't say difference, but the, the uncertainty is so small that the, there's really no point in uh, trying to think about the uncertainty in your location or your momentum. So this then leads us to determinancy versus indeterminancy. So when we're looking at things using classical physics, we can talk about particles moving in a path that is determined, determinancy, by the particle's velocity, its position, and the forces acting on it. If you know enough information about a thing, you can determine pretty much everything about it. You can determine uh, what uh, to a certain extent, depending on how much knowledge you have, what has happened to it in the past, that made it have you know the properties that it has now, you can uh, determine its future. So you know if you have, we're going to see an example in just a second of a pitcher throwing a baseball. If you know enough information about that baseball, if you know uh, what the friction coefficient between the pitcher's fingers and the baseball were, if you know the exact amount of force that he applied at certain points and you know the wind that is moving like you can predict absolutely what is going to happen to that baseball if you have enough information when it comes to electrons though and really tiny things like that we can't predict those things uh, because we can never know the position and the velocity like we can never know all that information about an electron which then leads us to indeterminacy here. This is an indefinite future. We can't say exactly where it's going to be and exactly what it's going to be doing. We can only talk about probabilities. We can only say there is a 99% chance that the atom or that the electron is in this volume of space around the atom. Uh, that is the best we can do, is discussing probabilities. Um, and we're going to find these regions where we have these 99 plus percent chance of finding the electron using uh, statistical functions. And so just again, here's a, an example of what we're talking about with determinancy, classical mechanics. If you know enough information about the baseball, you can say it's going to travel along this line and 
until it gets to here and you know either the uh, the pitcher or the catcher will catch the ball or the batter will hit the ball one or the other but with quantum mechanics we can't say the ball is going to be here and then here and then here and then here and then here it's just the ball will be traveling it'll be somewhere you know there's a 99 percent chance that it's in this this region here it's somewhere in there but we can't say exactly where it is or exactly where it's going as it's moving so that is the difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics so thinking back to the electron again for an electron with a given energy the best we can do is describe a region in the atom of high probability of finding uh, that electron In addition to this, um, if we had some way of finding the, the energy of an electron in an atom, um, that would actually give us a lot of information as well. So the, the energy of an electron is actually also related to the location of the electron in an atom. And a guy that you might have heard of, uh, his name is Erwin Schrodinger, developed an equation to describe the energy of electrons in atoms. And this is his equation. This is a simplified uh, version of his equation, where or condensed really is the uh, the more accurate term. The condensed version of his equation. Um, the H here is what we call the Hamiltonian. E is the energy of the electron, and then this trident-looking thing is the wave function for that electron. It is the actual mathematical function that describes the wave nature of the electron. And uh, Erwin Schrodinger's uh, equation here allows us to calculate the probability of finding an electron with a particular amount of energy at a particular location in an atom. And what's even more useful here is if we take this wave function that describes the wave nature uh, of the electron and we square that wave function and we plot it versus uh, distance versus the, the actual physical volume of the atom, it actually gives us a probability distribution map of regions where the electrons are likely to be found. It is literally a 3D shape is what that uh, graph gives you. And that 3D shape tells you where the electrons are most likely to be. So when we take this wave function, we square the wave function and we plot it versus distance, that gives us a 3D representation of the volume of space where the electron uh, is most likely to be. Um, and these wave functions that we use to develop these 3D spaces, which we're going to call orbitals from this point forward. Um, so the orbitals are where electrons sit in an atom. Uh, the wave functions that we use to make these uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, this uh, Schrodinger's equation produces many different wave functions, and the different wave functions are associated with different values of, of energy. So that the higher the energy of the electron, um, you'll have uh, different uh, wave functions as a result of that, uh, just depending on how much energy the electron has. So, when we take a look at that Schrodinger's equation and we start to actually look at the equation itself which we're actually not going to do here but just uh, let's pretend like we were we're looking at an equation uh, like at the Schrodinger's equation and we're looking at the wave function from that equation what we would notice is if you looked at a bunch of those equations for uh, electrons at different energy levels 
there'd be a whole bunch of just kind of blah, 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 blah stuff, and then you would find uh, some integer value, like maybe 1, and then blah, 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 uh, 2, blah, 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 minus 1, and then maybe some more stuff that we don't really care about, and then we'd have maybe a, a half. And these values, three integer values and then either one half or negative a half, show up in all of those wave functions. These are recurring values, which they, they can be different integers, but um, they are different values that show up in that wave function. Um, and so these numbers that show up in all these different wave functions actually have a very significant effect on both the size and the shape of the orbital that the electrons are sitting in. So because these values have such a big effect on the size and shape of the orbital, we give them a special name. We call these the quantum numbers. And these quantum numbers are going to help us figure out where inside of an atom an electron is sitting. And we're going to pick up with that in the next video where we'll talk more about these quantum numbers and what they tell us about an electron's position. So I'll see you in the next video.